Hey everybody, thanks so much for tuning in. Thanks for worshiping with us today. Hey, here's what I, I think is fairly certain about every last one of us. Whether, whether you are new to the life of faith or you've been in church every single Sunday of your life, I think for every one of us, we wonder, is there more to the life of faith? Is there a next step? And far too often we struggle to find what that next step. And to be honest, we as the church, we haven't been very good all the time at helping you find that next step. And so we are launching today a brand new worship series that's called What's Next? Because we believe with all our heart that there are four things, four things that God wants for people like you and people like you. My wife Katie and I were dirt poor and going to graduate school when we decided that we were going to get married. And luckily we had very generous parents who helped us pay for our wedding. But the fact of the matter is we had no money whatsoever to go on a honeymoon. Well, one day I was walking through the halls of the school where we attended and I saw this flyer uh, on the bulletin board and it said, travel to Germany. And as I, uh, I grabbed that flyer, I read it and it, it talked about how, how the school we attended was offering uh, the opportunity for students to travel to Germany, an all expense paid trip to Germany. It was a scholarship of sorts if the students were willing to study the German language all summer long. And when I saw this, a light went off in my head. A bell sort of uh, went, ding, this is it. This is how we were going to get a honeymoon. And so I took that flyer to my soon-to-be wife and I said, this is it. This is how we are going to get a honeymoon. And that's when she gave me the look like, really? And then she did, as she often does. She asked the practical questions like, do we really want to be studying the German language on our honeymoon? She asked, what if I get in and you don't get the scholarship? <laughs> she also said, do we, where will we be staying? Do we really want to stay in a dorm room on our honeymoon? Well, one thing led to another and the school we attended uh, somehow ended up awarding Katie and myself uh, a, a summer's worth of travel in Germany. We received the scholarships and spent the entire summer after our wedding in Germany. And it was awesome. We'd study German during the week, but then on the weekends from Friday afternoon until Sunday evening, we would travel everywhere. Well, why do I start with this? One weekend, one of the first weekends we were there, Katie and I were traveling all over uh, Europe that weekend. And we were hopping on train to train. And we were coming back to the little town where the language school was. It was late in the evening. And we were sort of oblivious to the world, right? We were newlyweds, we were in love, and we knew at the, there was a little town where we needed to switch trains. It was the middle of the night and we got off our train and we hopped on this other train in this little small town in the middle of nowhere, Germany. And we were oblivious to the world. We were oblivious to the fact that the train we got onto, well, there was no one else on the train. And then all of a sudden, again, in the middle of the night, the middle of nowhere, thousands of miles away from home, we didn't speak the language. All of a sudden, the lights on the train went out. And there we sat. We were stuck. 
Well, eventually we figured things out. But as I think about that moment, way back when, as we sat on that train in the middle of nowhere, we didn't know the language. I wonder, I wonder if for many of us, if that's how the life of faith sort of feels. We feel sort of stuck. You see, many of us, we, we grew up in church, we, we got baptized, we got confirmed, we maybe got married in the church, we had our kids baptized, and we attend church every now and then. But there's something about church that always seems a little foreign. When we go to church, the, the language of faith seems a little bit like a, a foreign language, if we will. We've always had this curiosity that wondered, is there more to this life of faith? But we've never been certain how it is we would take that next step. And so we're stuck. Or maybe for you, you're someone who has some friends whose, whose life of faith, they just seem to be on fire for their faith. And you, you've always wondered, how do I get a little bit of that? Or maybe you're new to the life of faith. You're new to, to church and you're, you're curious. But you're just not sure how it is you, you take that next step. You see, I think for all of us, wherever you find yourself, whether you've been in church all your life or you're new to the life of faith, we all wonder, is there more? And here's what I want to tell you today. The fact of the matter is this. There is more. There is so much more to the life and the faith that God wants for people like you and people like me. Here's a picture of Death Valley. Death Valley is one of the hottest, driest places on the planet. It's regularly over 130 degrees there. They get little to no rain all year long. But back in the year 2015, 2016, a unique phenomenon happened. Uh, in, the, in the fall of that year, they had, in a five-hour stretch, three inches of rainfall. Now, you might not think that's a lot, but in Death Valley, that caused major flooding. And once the soil soaked up all of that rain, it didn't happen immediately. But in the spring of that year, look what happened in Death Valley, huh? It's probably never happened before. It may never happen again. You see, what they found is that there were seeds in Death Valley under the soil. What they found is that Death Valley wasn't dead. It was just dormant. And when those seeds received nourishment and water and they were fed, things grew. And they grew amazingly. You see, here's what I think is true about you. It's true about me. At times, our life of faith feels as though it's death, it's death valley. And, but here's what God wants you and me to know. God has planted seeds deep within us. And when we put ourselves in the right environment, when we feed and nourish those seeds, we too grow and we experience the life and the faith that God wants for people like you and people like me. And so here's the deal. Over the next several weeks, we are going to explore we're going to explore four things that God, that God wants for people like you and people like me. Our theme for the next four weeks is going to be this, what's next? And we're going to talk about several steps in the life of faith. Several steps that we see repeated again and again throughout the Bible. We see it most clearly in the writings of a guy by the name of Paul. Paul was a church planter. He started more churches in the ancient world than anyone else. And he's writing a letter in the book of Ephesians to the people of Ephesus. It's sort of an intimate letter. And in it, we're going to read a portion where he talks. To, he's actually offering up a bit of a prayer to the people of Ephesus. And he's talking all about what he believes God wants for them. The four things that God wants for them when it comes to the life of faith. He writes these words. He says, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. He's, he's praying for him. He says this, he says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. What's he talking about here? These are sort of churchy words. What he's, what he's saying to them is my prayer for you is that you will gain clarity. You will gain clarity as to where you are and what the next steps might be in the journey of faith. So that you can discover in your life all that God wants 
for you. And so he's going to lay out here four things that he believes God wants for all of us. He says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Now listen to this. So that you may know him better. The first thing that God wants for people like you and people like me, Paul says, is that we might know God better. Here's what's interesting about this passage. This word know right here in the Greek language, it's the word gnosko. Gnosko, it, it doesn't mean sort of uh, to know as you might know a coworker or a friend or even a brother or sister. Gnosko was the word that you use to describe how a husband knows his wife and how a wife knows her husband. It's an intimate word. And the ancient people, when they heard that, they would have went, wait a second, this isn't how we know gods. Gods sit up on high. We don't know them intimately. But what Paul is saying is we have a God who wants, who wants you to know this God, not just in your head, but in your heart. Well, Paul doesn't stop there. Uh, he says, I pray, secondly, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Now, those ancient people, when they heard this, they would have said, well, wait, wait here, Paul. Paul, my eyes are in my head. They're not in my heart. But Paul knew what you and I know. It's this, that, that when we walk around most days, we live life, we, we look at life through the lens of our heart, through the lens of our past experience, through the lens of our past, our, our pains, our hurts, the things we've experienced in life, the tragedies that have come our way. You see, we, our heart often dictates how we see the world. And what Paul says is after we know who God really is, that this is a God of grace and love and mercy, God wants us then to, to find freedom in our hearts, that our future isn't dictated by our past, that rather than seeing life through the pain of our past, that we would, we would see life through the, the promise of God's future for us. Well, Paul doesn't stop there. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. Paul says, once we know God and once we do the work to free our hearts, what God wants for us is that we would know our calling in life. Where, where the gifts that God gives us meet the passions we have in this world, that we might find our calling and our way to serve God's people. And lastly, he says, once we know God and once we've done our heart work and once we've figured out our calling, he says that the riches of God's glorious inheritance in his holy people, that we would experience that as well. And those are kind of churchy words, but that language of inheritance, what's the inheritance of our Christian faith? Well, it's that together with God's people, we would make a difference in this world. A pastor and author by the name of Chris Hodges, he, he says these four things that, we, that Paul has pointed out could be, could be uh, laid out most clearly in four phrases. He says this, that, that what God wants for people like you and people like me is first and foremost that we would know God. That we know God, not just in our heads, but in our hearts. Secondly, that once we know God, that we would find freedom, that we would free our hearts so we're not living through the lens of the pain of our past, but through God's promise for our future. And thirdly, once we know God and we find freedom, that we would discover our calling or our purpose in life. And lastly, that we would be able to make a difference as God's church in the world. Over the next four weeks, we're going to talk all about these four, these four things that I believe God wants so deeply for you and for me. And today, in the little time I have left today, I want to talk about this first one, about knowing God. Because here's what I think. I think knowing God sounds like a simple thing. You might say, yeah, I went to Sunday school. I went through confirmation. I've been to church now and then. I know God. But I actually think knowing God is actually the trickiest one of this, entire, of this entire list. And let me explain. I want to explain by using an image from my childhood. How many of you know who this is? 
right? This is a Scooby-Doo cartoon. Remember Scooby-Doo? You had Fred and Velma and Daphne and Shaggy and Scooby. And what I loved about, uh, about Scooby-Doo is that they were always trying to solve a mystery, right? And at the end of every episode of Scooby-Doo, the gang would gather around the villain, like in this picture here right? And you thought you knew who the villain was. That was until one of the gang, Scooby or Shaggy or Fred, would reach over. They would pull the mask off the villain character. And sometimes, sometimes they would pull not just one mask off, but there'd be another mask and another mask and another mask. They'd pull these masks off to reveal who, who the real villain was. And when I think about knowing God today, when I think about all the images, the popular images that are out there for who God is today, knowing who God is is sort of like Scooby-Doo. We got to pull off the masks. Because for some of you, some of you, when it comes to the knowing God, you grew up in a home where knowing God was equated to religion. And you've got to pull that mask off. You see, God for you was a series of rules, a series of obligations. It was all these have-tos, you know, should-haves, all these you-betters. And for some of us, we've got to pull that mask of religion off and so, so that we can really know who God is. For others of you, it's a, it's a mask of politics, right? You, you've watched how, how all the political bickering has sort of made its way into the church. And you've got churches that support this candidate and other churches that support that candidate. And they say that God is on our side. You see candidates who, who, say, who, who use God in order to earn votes. It's another mask that some of you, you've got to pull off in order to know who God, who God really is. There's the mask of American prosperity, if you will. This idea that faithfulness is equated with wealth, with prosperity, with success. And for others of you, the mask that you've got to pull off is a mask that uses God to justify. To justify the great divisions in our world, whether that be race or gender, it be sexuality. God has been used as a, as a mask, if you will, to justify war and all kinds of injustice in our world. We've got to pull off the mask to know who God really is. As a pastor, I often find myself in situations where maybe I'm at a bar or I'm on an airplane and I sit next to somebody I don't know and we strike up a conversation and often that conversation, well, almost always, it gets to the point where someone asks me, well, what do you do for a living? And I always get a grin on my face and I say, well, actually, I'm a pastor. <laughs> That's when they look at me like, are you kidding me? And usually, nine times out of ten, the person I'm sitting next to will say something in response like this. You know, I'm not really into Christianity. I'm not really into faith. I'm not really into God. And often, maybe just to get a rise out of them, I'll say, actually, neither am I. And I say that because the Christianity they know isn't of the God I know. Generally, the Christianity they know is all about rules. It's all about this institution that said, this is how you should live your life. This is how you've gone wrong. And the fact of the matter, that isn't the God, the heart of the God we find, well, that we find in the Bible. You see, here are some images that we find in the Bible, who this God really is, who God wants us to know God as. For example, there's a story in the Bible about this father, this father who has a son who, for all intents and purposes, is kind of a punk. He comes to his dad and he says to his dad, Dad, I want my inheritance now while you're still alive. He basically says to dad, Dad, you're better off to me if you were dead and that dad gives him his inheritance. That son runs off. He squanders all of it. Squanders every last bit of his inheritance. And he comes back to his father's, his father's estate. And here's what the father does. He sees the son out at a distance. And here's what he does. He says, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf. Kill it. 
Let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. I mean, that father was made a fool out of his love for his son. In another spot in the Bible, in the book of John, we hear Jesus described as the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me, I know the father. And what? I lay down my life. For the sheep, this God loves you so much. This God gives up his entire life for you, regardless of what your life might look like. And in Romans, my favorite passage, it says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither present nor the future, nor any power, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. You see, friends like Scooby and Shaggy and Velma and Daphne, we got to pull off the masks that have hid this God so that we might know the heart of God. About six uh, years ago, uh, my dad seemed a little off. Uh, If you've heard me talk about it, you, you know that about six years ago, my dad, he started to sort of get some things mixed up. He mixed up his medication. He ended up getting in a few fender benders that were obviously his fault. He started to wander off from the house and he'd occasionally get lost. And it wasn't long after that that my my dad started to forget the names of his grandkids. And he even began forgetting the names of his own children. And it's been really, really hard. And about eight months ago, we placed my father in a care facility, a memory care unit. And since then, his, his health has been on the decline. In fact, at the beginning of this week, uh, our whole family was called to the care facility because they weren't sure if he was going to make it through the night. And earlier this week, uh, in that evening, my brother and I, we, we decided we were gonna stay overnight. And, and my dad, I remember he was just shivering And so I crawled into that little care facility bed with him and I put my arms around him and I I looked at him. I remember just laying there looking at him. And here's the thing, he still looked like my dad. You know, he, he still had the scrawny chicken legs that we used to tease him about. He still had those big bushy eyebrows he always had. He still had a love for ice cream that he's always had. He still had the same facial expressions, although one side of his mouth was sort of drooping, drooping a bit. But here's the thing, although he he looked like the same dad I knew, on the inside, he wasn't the same dad I knew. And I think for, for those of us who sometimes get stuck when it comes to the life of faith, knowing God, well, knowing God requires that we, we look at the world and at times we, we see things that look like God, but too often we know on the inside something's just off, something's not right. I laid there, I laid there with my dad and a little bit later, my brother was in the room and we did something we often did as kids. We did a lot of singing when I was a kid and we sang, we sang Amazing Grace and because my brother and I are kind of choir geeks, we sang in harmony. And you know what happened? My dad started singing and he sang every word of Amazing Grace. And of course, we're all tearing up and at the end I said, Dad, can I give you a hug? And my dad, in a way that we hadn't seen all day, he he reverted to some humor that he he had when he was with it. He said, well, I think that's a good idea. And of course, I gave my dad a big hug. For a moment, we caught a glimpse of who he really was. And here's the thing, knowing God, sometimes it's going to take that we do a little bit of work. We got to sort of wade through a popular Christianity that's out there in order to dig and find the real God, the God that God wants us to know. We got to take off the masks so that we can find that God who's like that father 
that father who had an irrational love for his son, like that Jesus who said, I'm the good shepherd. I'm going to give my entire life for you. I don't care what your life looks like. Sort of uh, like that, that one Paul writes about, who says, nothing will ever separate you from my love for you. Folks, I got a couple questions for you today. If you're gathered with your family, friends, your connect group, I want you to wonder about this. When it comes to your faith life, When have you wondered, is there more? There's got to be more. When have you had that experience? And secondly, how about this? What's your what's next? We all have a what's next in our life of faith. Is it it to come to know God? Maybe you've got to pull off some masks to understand who God is. Maybe your heart needs to be freed. You, You need to discover your calling in life. Or maybe it's time to use your gifts to make a difference in the world. And lastly, a last question. What mask do you need to remove from God in order to really know God? Folks, have a good one. doubt again echo within me every promise let your word be louder than my fears speak to the point when I can't see lift up my head in every valley let your joy be greater
Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you so much for tuning in to worship today. If you find yourself together with family, with friends, maybe your spouse, we invite you to head out to our website, uh, www.calvaryalec.org, and there you'll find a discussion guide. We'd love for you to keep the conversation going about all we've talked about today. Uh, Hey, if you find yourself in the Alexandria community, here's what we'd love. We'd love for you to join us for in-person worship. We've got an all-new worship schedule for the fall that starts this week. You can see it on the screen here. We've got two services on Sunday morning as well as two services on Wednesday night. We hope you can join us sometime for in-person worship. Also, if you're in the Alexandria community, we'd love to get your kids, your students uh, engaged in student ministry. Uh, we have several options for both kids and students. We invite you to check out our website, calvaryalec.org, and there you'll find, you'll find all the opportunities for you to get in fall. Last but not least, we want to say a big thank you for your generosity. Uh, we are so grateful to be a part of a church that is so generous. Over the course of this last year, we've been able to do so much, even amid a global pandemic, because of your generosity. This last week, we had 15 new families join our church family. We saw 350 kids come through our doors for vacation Bible school this year. We've had 47 baptisms already this year. God is doing great things through you. Thank you so much for your generosity. There are four ways you can make your offering today. The first is simply go out to our website, calvaryalec.org, and there you can hit the Give button. The second way is to use Venmo. You can do it right on your phone. It's super easy. Uh, the third way you can make your gift is to simply write out a check and send it to the address on the screen. And if you're just not certain how to make your gift, feel free to give us a call. And we would love, we would love to help you live the generous life that God is calling us to. Folks, thanks so much for tuning in today. We'll see you next week.